On this episode of Shop Talk, we have Adam Reamer, SEO expert and also Affiliate Manager of the Year many times at the Affiliate Conference. Adam, welcome. Thanks, Jim. So, you're an expert in many different areas, and I immediately want to jump to e-commerce. And manufacturers and e-commerce businesses booming, they're selling direct to consumer. However, there are a lot of mistakes being made. What are the three biggest mistakes that people who are selling direct are making? It's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see brands make, especially in the direct-to-consumer market, is that they forget about their audience. They'll listen to a branding team or they'll see what other people that try to sell to manufacturers or want to be carried in Target and Walmart and uh, sell elsewhere do. So they'll put up giant hero images and they'll set up a branding website versus remembering our goal as a direct-to-consumer company is to sell to consumers. So what they need to do is they need to combine the branding and they need to combine the recognition that they build through influencer marketing, through TV ads, through Google paid ads, and through other channels and let people find their products. So suppose you sell products for adults and products for children and products for pets. Instead of just showing one or two products on your website, what you want to do is you want to show people how to find the different brands or styles you carry. Like think of a clothing manufacturer, like this sweater is not going to fit on a little kid right. and it's probably not going to fit on a dog or a cat. So instead, why not sit there and say shop uh, adult clothing, shop children's clothing and shop pet clothing here. And then you can also have accessories. Direct to consumer brands also forget that they aren't necessarily known as well as they think they are. So if you're doing something that is unique or special or there's a reason why someone should shop with you, they want to also give their about story without distracting from the funnel. It should complement the funnel, especially in lines like skincare or um, body care or anything with health. You need to build the trust with the consumer to let them know they are in the right place. Another thing that's interesting that I see regularly is brands will forget to re-emphasize this is the product you saw on social media. This is the product from TV. So ways that they can do that are they can optimize pages in the search engines and on so that as people are searching, what is that writing tool or what is that toy that I saw on Instagram or what was the hair scrunchie I saw on TikTok, you actually have a page that can show up for that and re-emphasize that. You can also use plugins like stamp.io if you're on Shopify, for example, to pull in the feeds if the influencer or person used a tag. On your product pages, if you're running a ton of TV ads, you should incorporate the video from the commercial you spent all that money on into the page so that people you know, yes, this is the one I saw, this I am in the right place, I don't have to go to Amazon, I don't have to go to Etsy or somewhere else. And those are some of the biggest mistakes. They forget to keep people actually shopping. So if, I, if I'm a manufacturer, I make something, and I haven't sold direct to the consumer, I'm on Amazon, Walmart, but I want to start you know, selling direct to the consumer because retailers are taking less product, they're taking less product in store. Is that something that's hard to set up or is it a lot easier today? It's easy now. Okay. You just have to be smart about it. So you basically, you need to figure out how are you going to compete? If you were historically selling in marketplaces, you're competing on price and you're competing with free shipping. As a new seller and a new vendor, your shipping costs are gonna be incredibly high. You're not gonna get the same deals and rates that they have. So think about what is gonna be my advantage? Am I gonna say, hey, we're the little person that's just, you know, we're gonna try to take out the big guys here and we're gonna compete. Or, or like, how are you just going to do it? So one thing that I did with one company is we set up, this is the price on Amazon, this is the price on Walmart, this is the price on Target, here's the price here, you're supporting a small business. And we tried to go for emotions to try to get them to want to shop with us instead. We also can provide a more personalized experience. Like if your package gets damaged with Amazon, there's a chance you're stuck talking to live chat. We're gonna replace it for you. We're gonna be like the good people here. We're going to actually take care of you as our customer where these marketplaces don't care about you at all. They genuinely don't. And you're kind of just stuck in limbo. You're out your money. They might give you a refund, but you're definitely out an hour trying to chat with them and get a resolution. Now, I'm a reader of the, you know, one of the places I read is the New York Times. You know, I read a lot of dot coms. And so on the Times, I like Wirecutter. And Wirecutter says and puts it up front with every item that they have a link to either Amazon or another website. So, you know, they're getting an affiliate fee. How important 
for company selling direct are these affiliate links. So that's interesting. Wirecutter is an affiliate site only that was acquired by the New York Times. So oh, I is didn't C know that. yeah, and um, so is CNN. If you go on their homepage, you're going to see something called Underscored. That's their entire affiliate section of their website. BuzzFeed is almost exclusively affiliate now. Healthline.com also does the same thing. Healthline's actually pretty brilliant. What they do is they optimize articles for the traffic and then they feed it in. So if it was going to be the best green screens, for example, you could sit there and they'll talk about a green screen, how it was developed, how it does this, this, and this. And then they're gonna say, and here's how to buy the right one for your needs. And then they'll go into the listicle that you're used to seeing good housekeeping in Hearst Media, Cosmopolitan, Refinery29, Penske Media Corporation, that's Rolling Stone and Spy.com and those channels. They're all just affiliates now. And it's vital for it because you're able to then, once you're featured there, you're able to put the as seen in or as seen on logos, which builds consumer trust. Now, you don't necessarily need Business Insider, which is another affiliate, uh, but if you're a consumer goods company, because people would resonate, like if you're a fashion company, who cares if you're on Business Insider? Right. But they are gonna care if you're in Vogue and if you're in Cosmo. So it's really important to have the right mix, but I wouldn't count it out because Business Insider has an entire fitness section. They have an entire fashion section and they can drive a ton of volume. They're actually one of my top partners in some of our programs and we love working with them. They're based right up the street from here. Um, and the trick is getting in there. CNN will join you direct, but if you want to go with Hearst Media, for example, you have to go with Skimlinks. Skimlinks is one of my favorite partners. Well, I'm gonna stop you. What is a Skimlink? Because I Skimlinks is a sub affiliate network okay. where they distribute you out to these other sites. So all the site has to do is link to another site. And if that site has Skimlinks in their program, then it will turn it into an affiliate link automatically so the editors oh, don't okay. have to worry. There are bad things about skim links too. Years ago, you couldn't block specific types of partners from being in, but now Skimlinks has an entire merchant support center. So if you work with an agency like ours, we're able to sit there and say, we don't want to work with specific types of partners. Um, suppose you don't want cash back or something, then you could actually block them from there and now they don't have access to you. If you don't take those extra steps, then you could end up with attribution problems and losing a lot of money. But if you do want to get into some of these major media companies, you have to let Skimlinks in. And then, I believe it's $2,500 currently. Once Skimlinks is making at least $2,500 a month in your program, in commissions, then you get an assigned person. Uh, Jack, who actually lives in New York, he is the rep for a network called Impact, for example. And he's made a million introductions for me. He's just fantastic. And so that's how I'm also able to reach out. Now, what's interesting about these media companies is they have marketplaces where they say, here's our preferred vendors, yes. and that's how you now start to get featured. So then your PR team and everyone can go and they could reach out to editors. The editors can say, okay, we do have a relationship here. I can just link direct. They actually prefer on a lot of times to link directly to the manufacturer because it's more real than just, oh, go buy this on Amazon. Not that Amazon's bad, but. So I'm a maker of a product. What kind of traffic do I need to start a direct-to-consumer, or do you start the e-commerce and then build up traffic later? I would say it's neither. What you need is something that provides a solution and someone who can get the word out about it. So chances are you're not just gonna start showing up in the top result of Google no. for the term T-shirt. Right. But if you find someone that can, you can bring them on as an affiliate partner. If you find the right type of influencer or the right type of partner, just I've met celebrities randomly on planes and things, and they've done promotions sometimes. And basically that type of relationship can launch the company because it builds the trend. And then from there you build off of that further. Now you talk about people search Google. People also search Amazon first for product. Correct. I actually think it's more than Google. And now you have Edge from Microsoft. I mean, where do they rank in terms of overall importance? If you want Amazon, Amazon's going to try to show up for your own product names right. in Google search and YouTube. YouTube's actually the second largest search engine and it's a question and answer engine as well as an entertainment engine. So YouTube, so, is, correct. YouTube is the second largest search engine and YouTube is actually is it bigger than Google? Is there... No, Google's the number one. We're oh, talking Google's about one. US. The largest in the world is Beidou, which is China. Right. 
Uh, but in the US, we have Google and then we have YouTube, which is also a Google property. Okay. The interesting thing here is there's a lot of ways to work with affiliates. So suppose your sub pump broke or your water heater broke in your basement. Okay. You would then go to Google to say, how do I fix this? Or what is broken? Do I have to get this repaired? All of those are questions. Then you say, how do I fix a sub pump? You're gonna go in, you're gonna watch a video. That video could then say, here's the tools you're gonna need. Here's the products, here's the steps doing it. That person's going to need to purchase those tools. That's the perfect way to get your D to C product featured, but it's also solution oriented and the person's going to be watch it getting used or watch it being used. So that way it's building the trust with the consumer so that they know the product's quality. Then they come to you and shop. If you have a partnership with that YouTuber, the YouTuber earns a commission because they're making money now through ads on, on the video and through affiliate links, they have more incentive to continuously use your products. Now, I knew Google was you know, the top search engine in terms of search. How, how quickly is YouTube growing as a search engine for things like that? Honestly, I don't track. Okay. I do know that Google incorporates a lot more videos into their search results, right. so that's going to up your YouTube search or your YouTube views. And YouTube is also launching their whole shopping mechanism. They launched Kaya recently, which allows for people to shop on YouTube videos because they see the video and then they want to buy. Correct. It's which, exciting. Uh, since we're talking about SEO, has SEO changed a lot in the last five years? Never. Never? It's the same as 20 years ago. There's just new technology and new code. So for example, years ago, we didn't necessarily have schema. Schema is just a type of language that defines what's on the page. So for example, if you have a product page that has a video and has reviews and ratings, you would use video object schema, review schema, rate and rating schema, as well as product schema. Now as a search engine spider's crawling, it knows exactly what's on the page. You can actually put the wording and what's featured in the page into that page. Page, and now you've given a very clear understanding of the experience for the search engine. That's new, but the core concept of SEO is just giving the best possible user experience. So if I have a website that's strictly for my company, it's not informational, consumers aren't driven there, there's no e-commerce, uh, for what reasons would I optimize the website? There's really no point at that. Okay, there's no point. All you would do is that's just something you'd hand out a business card for because the minute someone just says, here's this about this company, here's what does this, right. they're going to show up above you because there's no reason for Google to show a blank site or just like an empty site with one image. Well, it's just, it's I'm, not I'm talking experience. more like a website that just features things about a company. It's... It depends on the query. So okay. Google's job, same with Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, right. their job is to actually show the best possible solution. So if there's okay. something that the company wants to show up for, but they're not actually writing, they're just linking out to a press release that went somewhere else, why wouldn't they show someone that's actually covering it and talking about it? So if the query was, did company XYZ do this? Google is probably going to show a blogger or a media company that said XY company did this and then have detailed information about it. So it's important for the company on its own, if it wants that top result, to explain their side or what they're doing or what their goal is. It doesn't have to be bad. It could be good too. Very few companies are Apple. Apple could throw whatever they want up on yeah. a page. It's gonna get a million of these things called backlinks, and that's just when a website links to your site. There's good and there's bad, but we're not gonna get into that. And Apple can fart on paper. Disney can do the same, and it's gonna attract a million things. Everyone's gonna go crazy because they have a diehard cult following. So they don't have to worry about it, but everyone else in the world kind of does. In terms of website development, you know, I go back, I look at Amazon. Amazon's gotten a lot better. Walmart has improved, but they were not the prettiest websites. And I've seen some really gorgeous websites that just don't get traffic. I mean, how do you marry the two? Something that looks good for the consumer, but also is very effective. What's more important? That's a good question. It doesn't I would always go, because I'm a marketer, go with what's more a better user experience. Mm. So I build websites and I have my clients build websites for the user and then we let branding after. Most companies go to branding and art and creative and copy right. first. Then you get this site that, although it looks pretty, it's kind of useless. It's hard to find product. We don't answer the person's questions. So a big misconception with uh, e-commerce and especially with SEO is that you should keep your product above the fold. That's true, but not at the sake of user experience. 
I always recommend putting copy above the fold. If you're going to sell hair products, for example, people want to know, is this for uh, black hair, Asian hair, is this for white hair, is this for damaged hair, is it for thin hair, is it for curly hair, will this work with this, is it going to pull, is it going to tug? So if you can actually answer questions like that above the product grid, you've now eliminated your live chat time, you've eliminated some of the customer support so they can actually deal with real customer problems, and you've let the person on that page know they are in the right spot so that they're ready to get into your funnel and check out of your store faster. So that's why it's really important. That's actually one of my biggest tips right there. People put their copy below the product rate. That's just spammy and stupid. No one's gonna read it. Put value adding copy above your products. Now, we know the importance of affiliate marketing in terms of building businesses, the importance of SEO, especially if you're doing e-commerce. Uh, what other factors like really important today that people might not know about in terms of having uh, an e-commerce site? Caring about your customers. That's the That's big thing. Everyone just feels abandoned. And how, how, how do you show them that you care? Listen to them. Okay. Respond back. You don't have to eat every cost and customers are wrong right. on a regular basis. <laughs> and but listen to your customers, figure out what their problems are. And yes, product is going to want to do this. Yes, you want to do this. Right. But if there's a core issue or your customer service has a problem or there's something wrong with shipping or suppose Tennessee or is not as good for a distribution center, so you've got to go to Dallas, do that. Make sure your customers are taken care of because that's how you're going to have money to do the fun stuff later. You know, you see in a lot of websites, a live chat that, you know, customer service. How important is it to have that and how effective is it and how costly is it? So live chat is not expensive. It's okay. effective if you have a real person there. You could use a chat bot, but right. you have to make sure someone can actually reach a person. The biggest issue with live chat is that it slows sites down substantially. Normally it's loaded through a JavaScript. So each time a JavaScript loads, it's an extra call from the server to the website. So that's going to slow you down. Plus, you want to defer the rendering. All that means is make sure your website loads first, make sure that it becomes interactive, then throw the whistles and bells up. And that's when you could load a live chat. Look and see if it's being used. And then one of my favorite things to do with a live chat is I take the questions people are asking and we actually put them into a database. Then we sort for the most popular keywords. You could probably build a Python script to actually crawl through and extract the biggest keywords and then put them into a cloud. Now you can incorporate that into your FAQs. You can incorporate that into your copy on your website and into your product pages. And now you actually know the issues they're having. You, as you go into product 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.2, you can then sit there and start incorporating incorporating the feedback in the biggest problems so that you can make a better product in the future. That's one of the beauties of live chat. In some cases, it's not being used. And at that point, why bother paying for it and why bother slowing your website down? Looking at e-commerce and digital marketing in the future, it's obviously going to keep growing. You know, five years ago, I went around and told everybody 25% of all businesses could be put online and I got laughed at. It's like it was at 5% and they're like, it's never going that big. It's now close to 50%. Where's the heading? And I know it's tough to predict the future, but when you look at your crystal ball, what do you see for the future of e-commerce, how big it'll become, and the importance of digital marketing? Things have been changing pretty fast and it gets really cool and it's affordable. The biggest thing I would say is don't be scared of technology. So there's people, Neiman Marcus launched a mirror a long time ago where you can try on clothes from the actual right. mirror and see what it's gonna look like on you yourself. Other companies are developing apps where you can put on your headset and you can actually see the product, see it, experience it. There's furniture stores where you can actually map out your own room with your own colors and see what the furniture is going to look like inside your room. And these things are becoming very affordable to do. And I would embrace it. I wouldn't be afraid of it. I wouldn't worry that your audience and demographic isn't using it. There's a good chance they are. Facebook, for example, is a much older SKU than younger SKU. And that's who everyone's pushing. I believe their headset's called Oculus. And that's where the audience is going. That's who can afford it. Younger generations are probably going to be buying the Nintendo versions of it. So just look for where your audience is and how can you make their experience better because Digital is not necessarily going anywhere, neither is retail. People are going to need to walk up the street to get something. 
So just think about how you can best cater to your audience. And even with e-commerce, some of my clients, we go and we do pick up on store. We give them the user experience. We answer their questions on the website. And then we say, by the way, we have a location near you. By pinging their IP, would you like to pick it up instead of waiting for three hours for delivery? You know, uh, that brings me to Omnichannel. We did not talk about Omnichannel. <laughs> okay. And I find Omnichannel, I'm doing it more and more. I'm sitting there and it's like, I need X, Y, and Z. I need a snowblower, storm's coming. Let me just order it and let me run to Home Depot and pick it up today. Is that gonna continue to grow? Absolutely, think about it. You're sitting there with your kids at home. It's a birthday, you forgot the candles or you don't have matches or a lighter to light it. So what do you do? You have to figure out who has them near me. So you go under your phone and ask Siri or you ask Alexa or you go to Google and you type candles near me or like party right. store near me or CVS is sold out. So you go there and you're like, crud, now what do I do? So then you grab your phone and it's the search engines are able to pull up product inventory and start showing you who has it available right, right. now. And so that's where the omni-channel is still gonna be there. So it's not, it's just think about your audience and how you can give them the best experience. And then everything follows suit from SEO to influencers wanting to work with you. We've had celebrities reach out to some of us at clients that are unknown brands and say, hey, I randomly saw this. Can you send me one? I'll promote it for free. It's been fantastic. Adam, thanks for coming to Shop Talk. Thanks for having me, Jim. And come visit us every month as we'll have a new episode with industry leaders.